Welcome to the Coach's Corner. Coach Clarence is an entrepreneur, financial expert, and passionate about helping people build and market their business. He has a creative flair for thinking outside the box and is always looking for the positive side of life. Now, here's Coach Clarence. What's happening, everybody? I was chatting briefly here with Sherry Saban. She is a, what I call a fitness professional in more than one ways, and I'm going to let her do her own bio. But uh, she has a really interesting topic that a lot of times I have fitness people on, and they kind of just talk about the things you hear all the time, like, you know, losing weight, count calories. So I think today I'm excited because we're going to dive into a little bit of a mindset thing that is happening in her coaching, and uh, which a lot of people have this issue of they know things they're not supposed to eat. They, they just do it anyway. And there's a reason because people ask me all the time, what is the success rate for people? And I say, well, it's really just a question of do they get it? Because most people know consciously that they're doing things that are limiting their health and they just keep doing it. So it becomes a why. It's not how many reps you do. That's That gets into semantics and just coaching on different levels. But the why people do things to sabotage their health. So with all that said, Sherry, introduce yourself, where you're from, how you got here, and then we'll go from there. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Clarence. I'm really happy to be here today. And I'm a health life and health and life coach based out of Montreal, Quebec. I actually got into this space, I don't want to say by accident, but almost by desperation. Because as you know, we move into transformation either by inspiration or desperation. And I would say for me, it was more around desperation. Um, growing up, I was super athletic and I was always involved in sports of some kind. When I was 16 years old, I was hit by a car. At that time, I was a varsity volleyball player, basketball player, track and field, all of the things and suddenly told that I was not allowed to play sports again. I went on to have a back surgery just that year. I had herniated a disc in my back. I was in excruciating pain, unable to shower or to even walk uphill by myself without any assistance and so that sort of kind of started the path into what brought me into health and fitness and what i found myself doing after getting that diagnosis after that first back surgery is just start hanging out with a very different crowd i wasn't the athlete anymore i actually started partying and spending time with a different crowd that did all the things my parents told me that i wasn't supposed to do and all the things our parents warned us about and I sort of followed that path up until my early 20s where I just woke up one day and I was like, who is this person? This is this is not me. I never saw myself this way. I always saw myself as this athlete and really engaged in sports. And so that was the first time I decided to go back into the gym. And at that point, I was in pain all the time. I mean, everything was centered around my back. How long I sat in a car, where I went, I always had to make sure that I had a place to lie down in because I wasn't able to sit for more than 30 minutes at a time. And so when I first got into the fitness space, I was actually doing a master's degree in chemistry, so I had no idea what to do in the gym. All I did for months was copy people around me. That What are they doing there? I don't know, I'm gonna do it. And what, what's that person doing? I don't know, I'm gonna copy them. And so. I committed to that. I stayed consistent for months and then eventually I noticed that my back pain was going away. I was able to get off my pain medication and then I bought a treadmill and I started running five minutes at a time until I built up to an hour outside and that just completely changed my life. It was at that point that I realized, oh my God, this is my, this is my passion. If I was able to overcome such an obstacle, I was told I was never allowed to play sports again. I may be paralyzed in the future and I was able to do this, then I want to help people do that too. And so that's how I got into the fitness space. I dropped out of my master's degree in chemistry. I went back to learn exercise science. I became a certified athletic therapist. I learned everything there possibly I possibly could get my hands on when it came to nutrition, biomechanics, in, in, injury prevention, and of course, fitness and training. And so that's essentially where it all started. I did go on to have a second back surgery in 2012. I was millimeters actually away from paralysis at that time. And the reason behind that was me not listening to my body. I was opening up my first CrossFit gym. I had a deadline. I was pushing through. The pain was there. I ignored it and I just kept going and resulted in a second back surgery where I was also allowed the 
privilege to build my strength back up. And so to make a super long story short, that's sort of where everything is at right now in terms of helping people overcome obstacles and overcome limiting beliefs around what is actually truly possible. All right. So right now, and thank you for that. Um, right now we're in the time of year where everyone's working on their resolutions in the new me and new year. What are some reasons that people fail in that scenario? Yeah, people are, I believe, outcome focused. And this is what society tells us to do. We have to focus on the outcome. And when we achieve that, then we'll be happy. So when I make a million dollars, then I'll be successful. And when I lose 40 pounds, then I'll be fit. And once I have a six pack. And so we have this idea in our mind that our joy and our success is on the other side of an outcome. And so when we make a commitment, and this always happens in New Year's, obviously, or we're about to turn 40 or 50 or one of the big, you know, something O's, we always have these big commitments of suddenly transforming our lives. And all we're focused on is what we want. But what we don't focus on is what we have to do to get there and more importantly, to stay there. And now what I'm suggesting is if anyone has noticed that they've tried several times to hit a really big goal and either temporarily achieve it or not even come close to achieving it, what I would suggest is maybe focusing on being system-based instead of outcome-based. So instead of saying, for example, I wanna release 30 pounds this year, we maybe can ask ourselves the question, who do I have to become to be the person who's 30 pounds lighter? And now that gives us actually a lot of information. So if I wanna focus on becoming the person who's 30 pounds lighter, I have to look at my whole lifestyle. Who am I spending time with? What time do I wake up in the morning? What's the first thing I do when I wake up? How do I eat all day? And if I'm not sure what that can look like, if I'm not actually surrounded by or influenced by people who are doing that, the first step is to connect with somebody who is. Pick their brains, understand how they live their life. And I'm sure Clarence, you don't realize because this is just a natural flow and it's who you are, but you have rituals all day long that make up Coach Clarence. It's not because you're outcome focused, but it's who you are. You live, breathe, and essentially are existing in that essence of who you are. And so the moment that we just release those outcome focused goals and we focus on the system, not only do we achieve our goals, but we maintain them and we sustain them in such an enjoyable way. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is the daily habits that lead to certain outcomes versus the goal. Like you said, 30 pounds, they get there and, you know, they may lose one or two pounds. And as you know, may gain it back and then they get right. frustrated and then they end up failing. I feel like a lot of people make goals that are unrealistic. I mean, yes. if you've went the last 365 days doing absolutely nothing, you're not going to be in the gym seven days a week. You're not going to stop drinking. You know, you're not going to do all these things. So who would you say is your primary demographic that you like to work with or your avatar, if you will? You know, I'm going to say women that are mothers, that are busy professionals. Those are those are the people that I connect the most with, likely because that's just who I am. I'm also a mother of two awesome girls and I'm a busy professional. And so it's interesting because in that space, we have a lot of limiting beliefs and we always have the limiting beliefs of time, especially time and just being too busy. And so when we allow ourselves to just be curious about what can be possible and what can be sustainable, so much can open up. And I find that demographic essentially why it's so dear and near to my heart is because it is these women, it's this, this demographic that surrenders every single part of their lives to take care of everyone else. And what we don't realize though, is that we as women are the center of the universe of our entire family. And when we take care of us, what we're actually doing is taking care of everyone else. And so when you work with this demographic, not only do you help support that person and see their transformation, but you see the transformation in the entire family as well. Gotcha. So let me ask you this. Um, <clears throat> one of your monikers, I'm looking at your stuff, is fall in love with fitness. How does one fall in love with fitness? Because most people, generally speaking, when they think of fitness, they think of what they see on TV, grueling workouts, eating lettuce. Just How does someone change their mindset to fall in love with fitness? Oh, so good. Falling, falling in love with fitness is really falling in love with yourself. And if you think about it, Clarence, most people, when they set up a health or fitness goal, it's because they're not okay with who they are. They're not okay. They're not in that loving place of who they are. And sure. so I have to lose weight because I'm so big and I have to do this because I look so bad. And there's a lot of negative self-talk. And so that sounds like torture. If I were to go for a run because I need to lose five pounds, that, that sounds like the biggest punishment ever. 
If I have to starve myself and go on a deficit diet because I'm not okay with my weight, that, that sounds like, again, torture. And so when we love ourselves and we're choosing foods that nourish us, that serve us because we love ourselves, that's a very different relationship with food than to deny ourselves or to restrict ourselves because we're not okay with who we are and how we look. I see. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, since your demographic is primarily women, uh, their ideas around body and eating. Yeah, where do we begin with that? And and that starts at such a young age for most women. And, and as you know, and, and by the way, as I say this, I also don't want to generalize because I know there's a lot of societal pressures that are also placed on men. And so we all are exposed to that. However, for women, because we are, quote unquote, the attractive gender, and there's just a lot of focus on just that attention, that attraction, I think from such a young age, the message is we have to be pretty, we have to be, be beautiful, we have to be attractive to men. And so because we operate from that place, we actually operate from a place of lack. It's not enough, not good enough, not not fit enough, not actually enough in the certain things that are is going to bring that attraction. And so when we look at women in general, we are exposed to that at such a young age. A lot of women start dieting at such a young age. They already start to obsess and focus on their body at such a young age. And the issue with starting to diet, which is, again, what a little bit of why I'm anti-diet and I'm really more focused around sustainable habits, is that every single diet holds ground. Every single diet has backup science to support why you should or should not eat certain things. And so when you, for example, are following the keto diet, there's science to prove that we should not eat carbs and carbs are very harmful and they cause all these diseases. And then if you decide to go on the vegan diet to release weight, not for ethical reasons, but to release weight, there's also so much science that backs up why we should not be eating meat. And so that becomes so confusing. We're told all you have to do this, all you have to do is this, and then you're going to get the results that you want. And then we do that. And then we don't always get the results that we want, or we get it short term and then can't sustain it. We then get this message that, we don't know how to eat. We're so confused around around food. And those who've dieted over and over and over again get to that place where they actually have food anxiety. They're nervous around food. They don't know what actually works for them. And more importantly, we've lost that intuitive connection that we have with our body. We no longer know when we're hungry, when we're full, what we're craving, what maybe our body is needing, and what it could be deficient in terms of nutrients. Fabulous. I love that. Uh, <clears throat> now... One of the things I noticed, and I've trained women over the years, is you mentioned uh, things that start when they're young. How do you see trauma affecting people? I see a lot of people who have habits based on trauma right. and sometimes uh, choices that are being made now started when they were a lot younger. Uh, so how, how do you take someone who's had trauma and then walk them to a phase where they're loving themselves again and and doing things because I think sometimes when you're knowingly sabotaging yourself, you don't fully love yourself. You mentioned falling in love with fitness, but you part of that is falling in love with yourself again. Right, right. Oh, so good. You're, you asked really brilliant questions, and this is so important. And, and it's also a very sensitive and, and delicate conversation to have because food is just a vehicle sometimes to mask maybe an emotion or a particular belief system that we have we can plug in or insert recreational drugs or gambling or shopping or even sex or porn because it all actually serves the same purpose which is to numb us from whatever we're currently experiencing. And the idea behind that is to move towards something to help us disconnect actually with our emotions and with our bodies and how we're actually currently feeling. And so we say in our Make Peace With Food program that self-sabotage actually is a nervous system effect. It is actually on a nervous system level. And the reason for that is because we don't oftentimes realize that we're operating from fight or flight or sympathetic nervous state. And I refer to this as protection mode. But for women, for example, who have experienced some sort of trauma, sexual trauma or physical trauma or verbal or emotional trauma, even food scarcity actually is a trauma. And food scarcity is either real because we didn't have food growing up, like literally our parents had a hard time putting food on the table, or we started dieting at such a young age. That's actually very traumatic too for the nervous system because the nervous system gives a signal to the body that we're not safe. And if we don't feel like we're safe, we start to drive these very primitive functions. And one of the most primitive functions is actually binge eating or turning towards food to help ensure our survival. 
And so for women, and, and especially when we're looking at sexual trauma, just because you brought that up, when, we, when we're looking at that in particular, unconsciously what we're doing by turning towards food to cope with what is going on here, and generally what's going on here is a lack. There's, there's something that's missing, and generally what's missing in that scenario is safety. But when we see this happening on an unconscious level, we're turning to food to almost create that protection between us and the person who has aggressed, aggressively attacked us. And so, again, it, it's so hard to generalize and just kind of boil it down to one statement because there are so many different roots as to why we get to this place. But we also have to understand that it's not us and it's not our fault. And a lot of the belief systems that we have and that feeling of lack is actually stemming from our childhood. If, for example, a woman was sexually assaulted in her childhood, she was assaulted at a time in her life where she was vulnerable where she did not have complete authority of her life. She didn't have agency maybe of her life and she relied on adults to feel, feel safe. And so what ends up happening is because there's that protection mechanism that comes up in the body, there's all these alert signals that are going on, we tend to look for a way to feel more comfort. And for us, obviously food is comfort, food is safety. That's why it feels so good to snack at night in front of the TV or to grab that chocolate yeah. bar because on a very primitive level and, and on a very animalistic level, food is safety and it allows us to feel that way and we turn to it anytime we're feeling that we don't have that feeling of security and safety. Yeah. So do you have a physical facility where people go into? Are you primarily online based? How do you coach people? I used to have a physical facility pre-COVID and thanks to COVID, I was able to transition online, which was really a blessing in disguise. It was something that I wanted to do a couple years before. I always wanted to connect and support people outside the four walls of my gym. And so currently right now, everything is online through programming, through private coaching as well. I see. Um, now, you, we were talking a little bit about uh, the different diets. Do you have a philosophy that you follow or is it set up to each individual? That's really great. Um, and... I'm actually anti-diet and then I want to also, every time we say the word anti-diet or intuitive eating, some of us might come up with this imagery because this is what we see on social media of people eating six, seven, eight donuts and like, I'm an intuitive eater and look at me, I'm eating burgers and I'm an intuitive eater and I'm eating processed food and I'm an intuitive eater and that's not really what it's about. So I'm anti-diet because I've noticed that throughout my career and even with myself, the more that we've restricted and the more that we've polarized food, meaning making certain foods emotionally positively charged or negatively charged, this food is good, this food is bad, I'm good when I eat this, I'm bad and I feel guilty and shameful when I eat that, what that ends up actually creating is that disordered relationship with food where we start to feel confused, where we now are starting to create unwanted eating behaviors such as binge eating or overeating or compulsive overeating. And so when we actually allow ourselves to be more in tune with our body, we're going to know when it's time to eat, how much it's, how much we're actually needing at that moment. And our body's not going to actually crave for junk food or for fast food because our body doesn't really know what that is. It doesn't really know what to do with it. That's why it's created this obesity pandemic and epidemic rather that we are, are experiencing because our body is not able to process or to actually utilize those, those foods in a way that feels like it's in resonance with what it needs. And so my philosophy is really, and if there was one generalization is first and foremost to be in tune with your body and to start to connect with the signals. For some people, eating more meat feels right. For other people, not eating meat feels right. For some people, eating more carbohydrates feels more energizing and for others it could feel more lethargic. And so that's where we have to start is just first and foremost, there is no one way to eat. There are many ways to eat and what we have to do is identify which is the right way for us to eat. And then second of all is to maybe just start start to connect with how the gut health is, is feeling or functioning. So how am I eliminating? How am I sleeping? And what kind of energy do I have when it comes to training? And so if we can start to just get into that, again, that connection with the body, we're going to have all of the signals. And now, finally, I think we can all agree, no matter what diet is being promoted or preached, we can all agree that eating real foods serves us more than eating processed foods. And so if we want to go back to what is most natural to us, let's rewind 100 years. Let's go see what our grandparents and their parents ate. And now we're coming back to source. 
We are meant to eat from the land because that's what's available. Except now today, the majority of the food that we eat is not real food, it's food-like substance. And now that is where a lot of the issues lie because again, coming back to what I shared previously, the body doesn't know what that is, doesn't know what to do with it, but then also we don't know what's in there. We have no idea what kind of chemicals are in there and what the long-term effects that the body is, has on those chemicals. All right. Intuitive eating, not assigning good or bad to food. All these things are important. I don't want to give away your mojo, but talk a little bit about gut health because that's, I mean, we as fitness professionals know about gut health, but it's a new thing. And we, the gut affects so many other things in our life. So, and I noticed something that you specialize in. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of gut health and how you yeah. address it? Absolutely. And so we, we hear that the gut health is, or, or the gut in general is our second brain, but I'm going to actually say it's our first brain because everything actually comes and stems from the gut. If you think about it, when you get super excited, you feel it in your gut. Or when you get really nervous, you feel it in your gut. Or when you say, oh, I got a feeling, I got a gut feeling, right? So this is, this is super interesting because we've actually almost undermined the influence of the gut on our regular day-to-day -day decisions. But what we want to think about gut health really is it's, it is the machinery of assembly and breakdown in the body. And not just that, but our immune system is also housed in the gut as well as serotonin. The majority of the serotonin that we produce in the body is produced in the gut. And serotonin is that feel good hormone. And so when we think about how we feel when we have an upset stomach or my goodness, even something as simple as constipation, if we're flying somewhere and we don't go for a day or two, we start to almost go crazy, right? And that's because we have toxicity in the body and the body's feeling that. And so the gut is responsible not only for breaking down nutrients and then assembling it to where it needs to be, but also removing toxicity. It's where enzymes are activated. It's where hormones are balanced. It's impacting our mood and it also impacts our immune system. And so, of course, we can continue to expand on that and talk also about the nervous system influence, especially when we are in sympathetic nervous state. When we are in sympathetic nervous state, we're not favoring gut. We're not favoring digestion. We're actually favoring muscle tissue because when we're in protection mode or sympathetic nervous state, what actually happens is the body is geared to either fight, run, or to hide or to freeze. And so the majority of the, the energy is going to the extremities, it's going to the legs, it's going to the arms, and that's where we also see a lot of adrenaline and cortisol. And so if we understand that when we are in fight or flight, the body's gonna favor the skeletal system and not favor the gut in general, then we think about how that can impact our results. If we're starting to change our nutrition, we're starting to work with a trainer, but we've got all the stress in our life and we're not seeing any weight drop and we're not seeing anything happen, let's address gut health. And now, how do we address gut health in this particular scenario? Let's address the nervous system. Let's address the stress that's happening in our lives. Similarly, if we are eating a lot of or consuming a lot of foods that are processed foods, that is also traumatic for the gut because it has to work that much harder to try to make use of whatever is available. That's another way that we start to see breakdown. And so if we're thinking about the body either being in fat storage mode or fat oxidation mode, fat release mode, we also have to identify that that all takes place in the gut. And so if that takes place in the gut, that's how important it is that we're ensuring gut health in order, to, in order for us to optimize our results. And the way that we can tell that something may be off is if suddenly we're experiencing a lot of bloating. We are eating something and then noticing that we're gassy, we're bloating, we're not maybe eliminating in the same way. We're noticing a lot of abdominal pain. We're noticing a change in the mood, maybe even foggy brained a little bit because when our gut health is not, let's say, um, not stable or we're having issues such as dysbiosis in the gut, we start to actually lose a little bit of that co cognitive sharpness or that cognitive focus. And so there's so much we can, we can talk about here when it comes to gut health, as you know, Clarence. And so what's really important also as I, as I share this and as I share anything is that we can't generalize and say this is the one thing and this is why because we have to get into what's happening in the environment because that impacts gut health. And not just our physical environment in terms of chemicals, but also our social environment. What is the social atmosphere that we're around? Are we in a toxic relationship? Are we around people who are making us feel unsafe? This is gonna directly impact the gut. 
What are we consuming? Remembering that our diet is not just the food that we're putting in our mouth. It's what we're watching. It's what we're listening to. It is yes. our electromagnetic frequency. It's everything. So yes. the moment that we start to notice that something is off in the gut and around our digestion and sleep and inflammation and the regular resting health functions that we use to measure where we are, now we can start to reverse engineer the source and then start to address that. Love that you're like hitting all the points. Um, okay, so let's take it down a little bit. So what about you? What do you do to de-stress? What are some habits you have? What are some things you like to do to your coach? You got the two girls, so you've got a little bit of stress in your life. How do you manage that? Because there are a lot of single moms watching and they're going, yeah, that sounds good. But how does she do all that? I got kids. I got a husband. I got a boyfriend. I got 40, 50 hour work week. How do you manage all that? Well, exercise helps. You may have heard about that one. Um, so <laughs> so that's, that's a little bit beneficial, but also connecting with nature. And it's something that I, I'm noticing we do less and less and less of generation after generation. And so mm. connecting to nature is connecting to source. And here we are in front of a computer and our phones are near us and we've got Wi-Fi going and we're constantly plugged into a lot of this electromagnetic frequency, which is sure. actually disrupting our regular cellular vibration. And so once we start to address all these things and we start to notice all these things, we can start to actually make some changes. So for me, I'm really all about my environment. So I audit my environment and auditing my environment is about auditing my social environment. It is also auditing how I am allowing my thoughts to take over. So stress, by the way, is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be a very powerful thing because stress, and, and we always talk about stress being so harmful, but stress is actually our drive to take action. So you can utilize that in a very beneficial way. Where stress starts to become harmful is when the thoughts are associated with worst case scenarios. When the thoughts bring up things that make us feel anxious or fearful or uncertain, that's where now stress is negatively impacting us. But if you think about every single athlete competing, they're under a lot of stress, except yes. they've learned to manage and focus that stress in a very powerful way. So, so it's understanding that our thoughts are the most powerful driving force of our human psyche. Whatever we think, whatever we describe ourselves as ends up being what we're going to do all day long to, to subconsciously confirm exactly what we're thinking about ourselves. And so for me, I say this because on a very regular basis, I'm always auditing these things in my life. And I'm always most importantly auditing my thoughts because it is our thoughts that either allow for things to happen or absolutely deny and prevent for things to happen. And so my morning always starts with a morning meditation. I don't look at my phone until about 9 a.m. in the morning. This is this is a uh, habit that I really had to, yeah, I really had to master. That's so, impressive. Yeah, and, and it's not easy. And if you think about how that's impressive, it's 9 a.m. and I haven't looked at my phone. Again, we have to ask ourselves, like, why why does that have to be a thing? Why can't we all actually let go of the phone for a couple of hours? 10, 15 years ago, I didn't have a phone that I was accessing all the time in the way that I am right now. And so right. why is that now suddenly a normal part of our lives? And so our morning routine actually starts in the evening. That's where we can start to maybe get away from blue lights a little bit. We can start to bring ourselves into calmness and also monitoring how much caffeine that we take so that we make sure that we have a really great night's sleep. And so monitoring our stress is going to start in the evening and it's going to bring you all the way through your sleep cycle because the quality of your sleep is going to determine the quality of your day as well as the quality of your metabolism. And so if you have a good restful sleep, you wake up in the morning, which is what I generally do up around 5, 530. I like to wake up naturally. I don't like to wake up with an alarm clock and I'll start my day with a meditation. I do a candle gazing. And then after I drop my girls off at school, I then go for a walk with my dogs in nature. I have to connect with nature every single day. I notice a direct correlation between my mood and then going for my walk in the woods with my dogs. So that's something I have to do every single day. And then as mentioned, I could do my workout in the morning. It might be a little bit at lunchtime, depending on my day, but it's around 9 a.m. that I'll allow myself to be plugged in. But by the time I'm ready to plug in, I've already fed my soul. I've already meditated. I've already gone for my walk. I've already connected with nature. And then it becomes much easier to manage the day. Wow. I'm very impressed. You are, you are doing a lot. Um, that's, that's really what I'm hearing. Because one of the things we talk about is freedom. Uh, one of the parts of my channel is financial freedom. 
you create financial freedom by creating a life that allows you to do that. Like you said, I, I don't touch my phone to nine. Someone who's got to go to work, got all these other things going on, this chaos, that sounds like insanity. Like, how do you not look at your phone? But you've created this life and it's by you sitting down. Did Will you say that at some point in your life, you sat down and said, okay, this is what is important to me. This is how I'm going to get there. Then you also said creating that instead of a vision and losing 30 pounds, what's that person look like? So obviously in that vision, you were like, hey, I'm not going to be able to, I don't want to touch my phone. You know, I tell people they complain about their jobs. I don't have time to do anything. Well, you can make that change. It's part of the things that you need to change to get the life that you want. Uh, let me ask you this, because we have a lot of people who are doing crazy supplements and going to get this removed and that removed. What's your take on that stuff? Do you think that's the easy route or do you think that that's just for some people are, I think that's the easiest way to get it done? Well, supplements have its place, but we also want to just maybe focus on that word supplements. Supplements are supplemental to your diet. And so if you're noticing that you're needing to constantly take vitamins and all these other things because you're deficient in so many things, the first thing is maybe let's address diet and let's make sure that we're getting all the nutrients from our diets. But essentially everything has its place and it's not about certain things being good or bad because, you know, I, I like to see myself as a holistic practitioner and I have a holistic lifestyle. However, I've had surgery on my back twice. And so thank God and thank goodness to allopathic medicine, I'm able to walk today. And so there's this fine balance where we have to be accepting for all the things to actually exist at the same time. But going through the route of just trying to find the quick fix in anything in our life, whether that's around financial success or around our health, that is our issue. When has it ever become so easy to have everything that you want that's so cheap, so fast, and, and didn't cost you very much, why has that now become a thing in our society? Similar to fast food, we're trying to live our lives in the same way. And then coming back to your point about financial freedom, financial freedom, let's put those two words together, financial and then freedom. The word is freedom. So if I have all of this real estate and I don't really feel free, and here I am trying to create a life of abundance, and yet I am super glued to my phone at all times, I don't get a weekend, at nine o'clock at night, if somebody calls me, I have to be available no matter what, I choose that over my family most of the time. How is that financial freedom? Because we've just removed the word freedom and just all we have now is financial. And so it's so important to notice, and I love what you said, is it's about reverse engineering your life. It is What is it that I want to create out of my life? And so... Uh oh, she's frozen. So I'm going to talk until she gets back. She is currently For a talking. long time, I was... You froze there for a second. So oh. go back, go back. Maybe half a sentence. <laughs> um, so compassionate overwhelm? Was that it? Yeah. Yeah. So so it, it's interesting. We see a lot of a lot of people, especially in the health and fitness space and the coaching space, burning out because of compassion fatigue or compassion overwhelm. Why is that? Yes. Because they make themselves available 24-7, forgetting right. that they have to fill their own cup first before they serve others. And yes. so taking time for myself starting to my day at 9 a.m., hard stopping in the evening, and also not working on the weekends was something that actually took me a long time to master. And unfortunately, it was after a few burnouts and emotional and compassion overwhelmed that I finally got to that place where, wow, if I don't, if I don't serve myself, if I'm not okay, then how can I show up for my clients in the way that I want? And so that was just a very, very powerful aha moment for me. And then the moment that I started doing that and I started to really feed my soul, my finances went up and my business expanded. And more importantly, I found joy because I also want to connect with who I am. And so it's so, it's so important to state this because we're so hyper-focused on success in our society. But is success really removing our freedom? I mean, because that the definition of success? No. Success is really you being able to live in joy all the time. And the financial freedom part now, that's a number that we decide, but that allows us to actually live our life. Awesome. All right. So whenever I have a coach on, I always ask them what are their, because I'm going to hold them accountable because I, you know, once we connect now, you're stuck with me. Um, <laughs> what are your personal and professional goals for 2024? 2024 um, personal goals it's, it's super interesting. This, this was actually something that was a little bit, um, 
that was a little bit uh, catching me a little bit off guard. So I started watching at the end of last year all of these documentaries on Netflix of people climbing Everest and and doing all these crazy things. There's all these like adrenaline documentaries, and so I started really getting into that. And so my personal goals for 2024 is to get more into mountaineering, to do some more treks, um, and just to maybe work my way up to Everest one day. And so this is just sort of something that landed so recently, Coach Clarence, and you're the first to know about that. And then for business goals, um, I really want to help make make peace with food more accessible to women. And so this was this is a program that I launched last September, and it's just continuing to grow. And right now we're just we're just pushing it, we're scaling it, and more importantly, we're allowing this information to reach more and more women to help them overcome unwanted eating behavior. Awesome. Well, if you go back in my library, I interviewed Jen Drummond. Oh, okay. Who yeah. Did the seven um, sub peaks, yeah. and uh, she has a book that's coming out. I think it's out already. It might be something you want to read. It's a lot of good tips in there. She tells that incredible story. A story like you, what I find a lot of coaches have is something that caused them to be great. They suffer a lot of pain. They become some of the best teachers. Um, accident, she had an accident. So kind of the same thing. And me coming from my troubled past and doing what I'm doing now, there's usually something that you've been through. You're able to um, empathize with other people and also provide clarity. And because I think most people feel like I just can't do it and you can, you know, it all starts with that positive self-talk. So if people are listening and they want to find out how to find you, how do they do that? So the best way is to connect with me on Instagram at Sherry Shaban Fitness. And then if you're listening to this today as well, and you're noticing that you have unwanted eating behavior, such as emotional eating or binge eating or nighttime snacking, anything that's really creating self-sabotage around what you're wanting to create and move towards, then I'll invite you to download a free ebook that I have that'll help you get on track. And that you can access at makepeacewithfood.com. There's a lot of self-reflection work in that workbook as well. And then of course, if ever you wanna reach out to get more support or information, I'm also available there. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today. And um, it, you never, I, I never know how a person's going to be, but it's always fascinating. I'm always impressed. Um, you seem to be very passionate um, and you seem to be thinking you know, the way people need to be coached, which is going beyond sets and reps. I'm really trying to move people away from that because everybody wants to know how many reps and sets. And that's so far down the road. And don't get me wrong, there, there's a place for that. But this, the real estate between your ears is got to be a focus because that controls all this, you know, because okay. as you probably know, there's people who work out, they're a hot mess. I have friends in fitness business and they, their lives are a mess. So, so it's really the mindset. So again, thank you for coming on. And um, this was fun. And uh, guys, she is someone that you should be following, um, fall in love with fitness again. Uh, uh, Sherry Shaban. Am I saying your last name correctly? Yeah, good job. All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Clarence. And you're also super amazing at what you do. Keep doing what you're doing. So much passion and so much love coming off of you. And I've just had such a pleasure having this conversation today. All right. Thank you.